Welcome to Little Breaks Virtual Book Tour. Today we're talking to Emily Temple, author of The Lightness. So freaking cool. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Can you tell us what your amazing book is about? Yeah, it's about, ostensibly it's about a teenage girl whose father goes missing and she follows him to the last place that she knows where he was, which is a meditation center in the mountains. Uh, she signs up for this you know, program for troubled teens so that she can get her foot in the door. But it's told from the perspective of her older self looking back and trying to figure out what happened um, when she sort of, she falls in with this group of mysterious girls who definitely know one thing, which is that they want to learn how to levitate. So she decides like that seems fine and normal and goes <laughs> along with that. And then, you know, to varying results. <laughs> mm -hmm. Definitely varying results. Uh, <laughs> I loved your book. I think it, it had so much mystery and secrecy and spirituality it was so much fun to read um Thanks. yeah and i you know you cited in a recent interview that your upbringing was one of your inspirations uh your father was a student of trungpa the tibetan teacher who brought buddhism to the west and you spent your summer at a shambhala center in vermont i love that the sense of place in your book is so there, like the camp that they're all at in the mountains is has such a presence. I guess, you know, when you're like reflecting on your own relationship with Buddhism, how do you decide, okay, I'm gonna turn this part on its head or I'm gonna make, I'm gonna pervert <laughs> this part of my, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Honestly, I didn't have to work that hard to pervert it. <laughs> I think, I mean, in a way, I want to say like all religion is kind mm -hmm. of both perverted just by its own nature and like this essential thing that humans are drawn to seek and create. For sure. Um, but, you know, one of my central conflicts with my own relationship to Buddhism for sure um, is that while I think the teachings are very valuable I think the packaging especially with Tibetan Buddhism which is a system that involves venerating the guru and mm -hmm. seeing the guru as pure and it is like you know like so many other religions it's this hierarchical system and it's a patriarchy and you know, I think that packaging is so damaging. Yeah. So that's a central conflict for the novel as well. So it's like, you know, are maybe these things do have value, but they're not, they're being abused or they're mm -hmm. being used in the wrong way. Um, I mean, I also think, I think, you know, the, the, there's another conflict that applies to all religions in general which is you know people can make a mess of things when they mm -hmm. misunderstand or willfully misinterpret mm -hmm. what the teachings are saying mm -hmm. so that's part of where I was coming from to trying to sort of show even even our you know the people that we're supposedly rooting for who may have like certain ideas about how these teachings can be used but maybe that's not how they should be used. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah, it, it was interesting to see that they wanted to, because levitation is supposed to be this gift that's for a select few. And so I love that the girls were trying to choose something for themselves in a somewhat uh, misguided, but amazing <laughs> ways. Um, and, you know, I love that words in your book that meant so many different things. Um, like, you know, there's this idea that emptiness makes levitation possible and it, it can be an empty stomach. It can be, you know, understanding the illusion of reality or it can be, you know, a lack of personal relationships. And when I kept hearing them talk about that, it kind of reminded me that all of these girls have been like abandoned in some way. Um, did you want to explore how abandonment ties to like needing kind of like a spiritual comfort at all? Yeah, I mean, look, people want what they don't have, right? Mm -hmm. And that is just, 
a central truth of experience. <laughs> and once you have something, you don't want it anymore. For sure. Um, so when I was thinking about, you know, I think I sort of got into exactly what you're saying when I was thinking about, okay, like what kind of girls would go down this rabbit hole? You know, because there are some people who would be presented with this idea, oh, we're going to learn how to levitate and it's going to like change everything and like make us powerful. And they'd be like, nah, that's, mm -hmm. I don't need that. You know, some people yeah. would not need it. And so in, in characterizing them and thinking about them, you know, they're all missing something essential or they feel that they're missing something essential, something, some kind of connection um, or, or some kind of empowerment. They mm -hmm. feel, they feel depowered by their circumstances. And I think in, you know, in real life, in my experience, that's often when you feel that way, that's when people seek out religious mm -hmm. comfort. I mean, spiritual comfort, as you put it. Um, and so that's just, to, to me, that just seemed to make sense that those would be the girls who would be there, who would be doing this, For sure. are the people that like particularly need that, need totally. something in that space. Totally. And they, they all felt so real because their psychology isn't really explained like that, but it does come across, um, I guess, just because they're so smart but they are so desperate to be powerful <laughs> and like the chosen yeah. one. Um, but I love them individually and I was afraid of them individually too. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's this initial description in your book of all the different types of girls at this camp, as you know, and it goes, you know, so the girls at the center were trouble. And then it goes for about a little over a page, which I loved. And for some reason it reminded me of gone girls, like cool girl speech. And I think that's only because there's kind of this like weird power. I don't know if that's the right word for it. When women or girls like accurately describe what women and girls are, if that makes any sense at all. Um, were you inspired by novels or even experiences of like women coveting like other women at all? I'm not sure that I can think of a novel but I think you're, you're right to point out the Gone Girl comparison because I thought, I've thought a lot about how, about the male gaze, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we, we talk about the male gaze, um, which is like objectifying women and compartmentalizing women, but women also use the male gaze mm -hmm. because this is the way that we are taught to look at ourselves and other women. Mm -hmm. But I do think that, you know, women are able to sort of subvert it in a way because there is this like specific kind of magic in the way women, and especially young women, I think, look at and evaluate and categorize and perform for each other which like can be sexual or not sexual or something in between mm -hmm. but I've always thought there was something really electric in that and I don't think yeah I mean I think it came more from my experience um as a teenage girl where mm -hmm. you are constantly sort of holding yourself up against everybody else. And that means that you're looking at yourself constantly and you're looking at everybody else constantly. And there's always, there are always these people who seem like magic to you mm -hmm. and they just, and, and like, but what, and what creates that? So actually that section, I wrote it really early in the mm -hmm. process and it helped me establish my footing quite a bit. So I'm glad that I'm, I'm glad you liked it. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, the whole novel would probably not, you wouldn't like it. <laughs> no, it was, it's great because it, it does that, that weird, like desire can mean so many things like a teenage girl. Like, I feel like it's like, I just covet the type of girl that you are. But then we do have that close friendship where we are in close physical proximity. I just, I don't know. I felt like there were so many layers to your book that I just totally loved. Um, and she doesn't know 
that much about her three new friends in for the majority of the novel did you in the writing process need to write out their backstory even though we might not necessarily know it just to know I guess what kind of mystery you're leaving out I guess oh yeah I mean there's so much backstory that got cut <laughs> for the sake oh of God. narrative flow like I when I write I keep a graveyard file so no matter mm. what I'm working on I have that file and then I have that file graveyard <laughs> and I cut by the time I published this book I had three times the length of the draft wow. in the graveyard so there's a lot more, <laughs> um, but it, you know, when you're editing, you end up getting just to what's necessary to tell the story at hand. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of scenes that I'm sad about, but you know, <laughs> so it goes. Totally. I'm like, now I'm like, so would you ever do one from someone else's perspective? But then I guess you're just sort of, but I'd be interested because none of them felt like, caricatures of girls they all felt like I'm like I know there's a whole story behind each one of these guys that's just in a all serious. <laughs> I know I'm like can we do all serious it's so 2021 isn't so depressing yeah right um, they also the girls on their path to try to make levitation happen experiment with witchcraft I really liked what they did with their periods I was here for it 100% um, did you look at Coven's <laughs> at all? It's to ask, did you look at Coven's? Let's talk about periods though, if you want. I've visited many Coven's. No, I, <laughs> it's funny because I feel like not specifically, but that stuff has just come to me via cultural osmosis. Mm -hmm. So I, when people started reading the book, I started hearing comparisons to the craft, mm. which is funny because I had not seen the craft until people started comparing my book to it and I was like it was just like one of those movies that I missed um and I was just like okay like what is it and then I watched it I was like oh obviously like this is my shit like why yeah. have I not seen this yeah um but interesting but I do think like groups of women who try to gain power, even just simply over themselves are often coded like this, like mm -hmm. our covens, our witches, like they're evil, they're out to destroy mankind, mm -hmm. just men. Um, <laughs> so, but I think, I think that idea, like the basic idea of the coven has definitely permeated me, but I don't know, like I actually would like to know more about covens. <laughs> I know. I was while I was reading your book, I was like, I need to learn more about Coven's. I don't know this what inspired her, but I'm into <laughs> it. Um, also, you know, that phrase "desire is the root of all suffering" is an important one in the book for a lot of reasons. But when did you want to know that you wanted to include the character Luke in the story? He's sort of a crush that may have clues to what they're trying to solve, may not in the shortest version. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, Luke and Serena were kind of there from the beginning as counterweights to each other mm -hmm. because like the traditional narrative would have you understand that they, there's like a male charismatic leader and that the young girls like fall sway to the man who's the spiritual leader mm -hmm. um, and there's truth to that narrative because that's, you know, that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's part of the problem, again, as I mentioned before, part of the like whole patriarchy problem with not just Buddhism, but lots of religions. Yeah. But, so I didn't want to totally erase that, but I also wanted, you know, without giving too much away, I wanted to present another option, like a sort of another side of that figure. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so he was always there. So he was always there, but his fate wasn't always the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I <laughs> will leave it at that because I could go into that yeah. forever, but that will ruin everything. Yeah. You know, I love that Olivia's perspective kind of goes off on these offshoots on Buddhism and gory fairy tales 
and levitation and Greek myths and all these different things that she's reminded of as she's thinking about these things. And I love that because that is how, at least that's how my brain works too. Um, yeah. And you know, I know that this started as a short story and then you worked on it in school. What lessons did you learn about, I guess, first converting that short story into a novel? So many. <laughs> yeah, so many. I mean, I look, anyone who writes their first novel I don't know I'm about to say this might be a lie but anyone who writes a novel like for the first time will tell you that like they don't know how to do it after like I don't I'm trying to work on another book and I'm like how did I ever do this once I don't it's so hard I don't know how to do it um, so but I will say that like going from a short story so it was like 20 pages to there was a time when it was 500 pages and now it's like you know a nice under 300 but it was helpful for me to sort of submit to the two two different phases of writing. So mm -hmm. basically waxing and waning. So when I was trying to make it into something longer, I would just every day would be a thousand words and it would be production, 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 production. And that's when I started putting in everything I could think mm -hmm. of, everything that related to levitation, everything that related to like, you know, basically I let my own brain do what Olivia's brain does, which is like jump from thing to thing and make connections and call up memories. And I just put as much in as I wanted to. And then I would get to the end and I would do like a waxing phase where mm -hmm. I would cut everything that didn't work. And then it would get smaller again. And then I would just repeat that over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And that kind of worked. I mean, in terms of building from something small to something big without it feeling too like false, mm -hmm. really, it, it was like a natural growth process. I mean, and then, you know, the other thing that I really relied on is again, that graveyard file because you can cut anything. So I would cut anything that I felt like maybe wasn't working, I would cut it. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. if I missed it, I would put it back in. So there's like many zombies in there mm -hmm. that, that are currently in the book where I just like, even in the last draft before mm -hmm. it went to publication, I was like, you know what? I really like the passage about Sleeping Beauty mm -hmm. was cut for a long time, for a year it was cut. Wow. And at the end, I was just like, you know, I really need that. I'm going to put it back in. I love that part. I'm so glad you did. Yeah, see, I missed it. I was like, oh, it's Sleeping Beauty. And I didn't even know that that was the real gory version either, which was important in the context of everything for sure. Yeah, not a good story, really. <laughs> not really, but fascinating to show how she's feeling with all these different tangents, I guess, that she's going yeah. on. And that's what you just said is so helpful because sometimes in writing classes, they teach structure so much, which is so important, but you don't really get taught how to let the feeling just sort of run. And I guess, like you said, it's, you just com you know, try to commit to a certain amount of work every day. And in that, am I getting that right? <laughs> yeah. Cause then you just, then it's like, you got to give yourself permission to not have it be perfect as it comes out of you. I, I don't, I know people are different, but personally I would rather have 10 pages of a mess mm -hmm. and edit them, be editing them down to five than to have to start from zero and write five pages. Mm -hmm. I just, I would always rather have some, even if it's like the lamest, like, most nonsensical clay I would like to have it there and then I can sort of whittle it down so you have to do those periods of production right. and then you can sort of take your critical eye but I feel like a lot of people get stuck rewriting writing and rewriting and rewriting the first page mm -hmm. because they want it to be perfect because they like have good taste and they look at their own writing and they're like ah this isn't you know what totally. I want it to be but you just wait it will, it comes, it just eventually will get there. <laughs> I know the whole beginning, you're, I'm always like super terrified, but I'm like, it'll sort of, I don't know. Did you feel yeah. like that? Like this is either gonna be really bad or this is gonna be on par? Or were you always pretty confident in your writing? Oh, no, I th 
thought it was going to be terrible most of the time. <laughs> okay. And That's then sometimes confident. I would like write one thing and I'd be like, this paragraph. Is <laughs> okay. The rest of it can go to hell, but this paragraph, very good. Yeah. And then Tombstone I just, worthy. Exactly. You just like, and you just, I don't know. I just kept going over it and over it until I liked every paragraph. Mm -hmm. You just like can, I could spend a week on like one little section just to make it, but that's fun. Like you mm -hmm. get to have the time and no one has to see that draft that you write and know is terrible. For like sure. That's where I am now on my next project where I'm just like, oh yeah, I've got 75,000 words, but they are a mess. No one can see it. <laughs> that's, I love that graveyard file. I'm gonna yeah. keep that. It's so that's important. Amazing. It's really good. Yeah, what was I just gonna ask you? Oh, I know you're the you're the managing editor at Lit Hub. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Um, how did you keep? Because I guess we. I mean, you obviously have a huge career in knowing what sells and knowing structure in a totally different way than someone like I would. But there is that thing of like we just talked about removing that voice. How did you do that? Like knowing what's gonna sell and kind of following your own weirdness, I guess. Uh, it's tough. I mean, it, it is tough to separate that. Um, I, because, you know, I know books come across my desk every day. I mean, I no longer have a desk, but <laughs> books, <laughs> I see books every, all the, you know, when I was in the office, we would get just huge boxes mm -hmm. just of mail all the time, every day, galleys coming in. And Sometimes you have to judge the book by not necessarily the cover, but what the description is. And so I did have in my mind that I wanted it to be something that would excite me. Mm -hmm. So to that extent, I did, I did when I was right at the very beginning, when I was thinking about what the book would be, I thought like, what would be exciting to me if I saw it come? not like what would sell a million copies mm -hmm. or anything because that's a different question actually mm -hmm. um but i wanted to be so that's sort of that's kind of where i got the levitation thing because mm -hmm. I, I was like that would be something i would be i would want to read about for sure because it's like weird but within the realm of our current imaginations and cultural interest um so yeah, so, but you really have to, you can't think about the market, like it, it's not helpful. Also, it took me five years to write this book. So like whatever was popular when, it, when I started, I mean, the world was so much better when I started writing. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm so grateful your book is here now. Cause it was such an, it honestly was an escape for me, even though I was like, you know, worried and nervous and excited and afraid for Olivia the entire time I was it was such a huge escape um but that's interesting yeah that what, but I mean I guess what you were interested in writing or reading about stayed the same it's how you know I suppose it's funny I mean I don't think that this is the book I would start right now mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean I don't like it it's just that it was the book that was speaking to me at the time. And I thought like, oh, it's working. It's work, you know, I, I it, it kept working enough. Mm -hmm. There was enough, I kept seeing something in it to keep working on it. For sure. But yeah, I mean, now I have a whole other set of like, there's a whole, there's a different answer to the question of like, what book do I want to come across my desk? Totally. And so I'm trying to write towards that, you know? And I think that'll probably always be the case. Can I ask what any current things are that you're interested in without you telling me anything important? <laughs> I'm writing about um, the question of if you know someone's fate, should you tell them? Love that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, because it changes person to person for sure. Endless, yeah. endless. Um, last question for you. And thank you so much for coming. I was so freaking excited to talk to you. I heard on the Bellatrist interview that the cover art you had somewhere before it was your cover art. How yeah. did that, I guess, kind of be this totem for you as you were going to kind of keep igniting you? 
Well, I have, I don't actually remember where I discovered her, but there's this collage artist named Beth Hochul. And I had seen her work. I, and my mom, my mom has made collages since I was a kid. So I've always loved collage and it's always, I've always like been excited by collage. And, um, you know, I had my entire bedroom door was covered in decoupage, like stuff I cut out of magazines when I was 14. Um, <laughs> are there even magazines you can cut stuff out of anymore? I don't know. I know. I did the <laughs> same thing. And now I'm like, do I really, because all the used bookstores are gone. I'm like, do I really go buying new ones? Anyway, yeah, as you were no. saying. It's not, it's like, you know, you can just do it in Photoshop. But yeah. um, <laughs> so, so she was a designer and I was looking through her work and I just saw this image um this collage and it's you know the, it's basically the book but it's the book cover is a little bit cropped but it's that's the image and I was probably a year into working on it I, I was I had decided to do it for my thesis and I just saw this image and I was like oh my god like that is exactly the tone that I want mm -hmm. the hard and the soft the sexy and the dangerous the like mysterious the power that somehow her mouth is like it's just the power inherent in the image um I this is this is my tone and so I bought it from Society6 in a print as That's the awesome. biggest print they had and I hung it in front of my bed because I write in bed so um and I also at that time I was the editor of a literary magazine and I reached out to her and commissioned a cover for the magazine from mm. her because I was just like, let me stalk you. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so I finished the book staring at it. We're looking at it every day as I wrote and really just using that as a touchstone. And so then when they said to me like, hey, do you, you know, they said, you have any thoughts about the cover? Do you want to make a Pinterest board about what do you want the cover to be? And I was like, yes, I have a Pinterest board. It's this one. <laughs> like it's super simple actually it's this like it's one so simple and luckily they were able to buy it from her so that's amazing that worked out. <laughs> that's awesome I'm not really like the manifest person but it feels like it's a manifest moment yeah I mean I did I'm not either but I maybe it's just to like I bullied my way to <laughs> cover I wanted <laughs> yeah you stalked the cover just stalked it, it stalked it was like this <laughs> is it <laughs> actively manifesting it for sure yeah. um cool raising your hand yeah <laughs> that's a good lesson though I mean you know you, when you know your tone believe in it go after it yeah 100 <laughs> percent. that's awesome well thank you so much for coming on our virtual book tour here's your book one more time the lightness everybody should check it out and thank you so much I really appreciate it thank you this is really fun